Glad that you're worshiping with us. Glad that we could be here to uh, to celebrate God. And uh, hopefully you've had a chance to hear him, to see him uh, portrayed in the way he helps us through some of the mud pits of life and, and some of the, the challenges we face uh, through some of our technical difficulties, some of the glitches and issues that we may face in our, our day-to-day experience. We're glad that you could be here today. Um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I have two words that have almost become the motto of my family when we're at home and enjoying just a nice, quiet opportunity to sit and watch something together as a family. It's, these two words are some of my kids' favorite words to say whenever we sit down and watch something. You know what those words are? Skip intro. Anybody know skip intro? Anybody love using skip intro? For those of you who don't know, uh, about what is it, about seven years ago, Netflix decided to add a feature to their videos to give you the option to skip the intro for some of their, uh, for some of their TV shows. If you're watching a TV show on Netflix and you're watching it and you're binge watching it, it can get kind of tiring to watch the same intro over and over again especially if it's rolling around every 25 to 30 minutes. So they gave you the option to skip intro. A report that I found from Netflix said that as of 2022, this is the most recent time they shared statistics, that the skip intro button is pressed 136 million times a day saving its viewers a cumulative 195 years from having to watch the intro over and over again. This has actually led to uh, what I've heard uh, lamented, and, and it's not too hard to find. If you type in the most impatient generation, they will definitely say it is the current generation, what is known as Generation Alpha. Unless you find an older article, and then it was definitely Generation Z. Unless you find an older article, and then it was definitely the Millennials. You catch my my pattern here? Unless you find an older article, such as when I, 20 years ago, had to write a research paper on our demand for instant gratification, they blamed it on Gen X. Now, I know if you're Gen X or if you're in the boomer generation, you're going to step back and say, now, we're not that impatient. Are you, though? Let's be honest. How many of you decided that the process of preparing for a meal took too long and you decided to skip intro your way through the drive through How many of you decided to... Which generation was it that decided to skip intro their way through preparing a wholesome homemade meal and decided to toss something in the microwave instead? Which generation's fault is it for bringing us TV dinners? And now we could talk about impatience. I think people of all generations can relate to this one. How many of you find the microwave too slow? Now, I... Here's how I know if you think the microwave is too slow. How many of you have ever taken a plate of food out of the microwave and found half of it is so hot it'll melt your tongue and the other half of it is still ice cold and you say that's close enough? You mix it together, it's okay. We have become an increasingly impatient people. Across all generations, and every generation has found a way to skip intro their way through life. We continue to push for faster and immediate. And another way that I know that people of all generations are looking for fast and immediate, we've all been conditioned to now expect instant responses. When we reach out to somebody... I was reminded not too long ago that we need to go up to the trail center. If you had an urgent message to share, the best way to do it was the telegram. Unless a buffalo took out the poles. And if you go into the trail center up at the top of the hill and you push the button and you wait and you see what your, your fate is, it's amazing how often there is a delay of some kind. Your message arrived too late and you couldn't get uh, 
get your stuff on that ship. You couldn't order that thing. You couldn't sign up for that, that opportunity. You missed it by three or four days. Now we're at a point where we can send the pastor a message, and it, as soon as it says delivered on the bottom, now we just start counting. One, two, how long is it going to take to get back to me? He received it three minutes ago. We are an increasingly impatient generation and people. It's just how we have become. And ultimately, it leads me to this devastating question that we as believers in the second coming sometimes have to struggle with. What do we do when soon isn't soon enough? Today's message is not exactly about the second coming, though, because we are doing a series through the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and taking a look at some of the little stories that happen in the immediate aftermath of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last week, we had a chance to look at just a fun little race that Peter and John had, and definitely didn't teach us anything about our walk about faith, right? And the need for partners, for example, somebody to encourage us to take the next step, to look deeper. No, we didn't worry about any of that stuff. Last week was just about Peter and John doing something silly. Uh, This week, though, we are dealing with the the question, what happens next? Because Peter and John were not the only two who ran to the tomb that day. There's still somebody who's left straggling behind. Peter and John ran there. They ran home. What happens next? What does Mary do as she waits? What do we do as we wait? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together and to wrestle with what happens when soon isn't soon enough. What happens with our our desires for faster and immediate, and faster than immediate. Lord, help us to know what to do when we're struggling to find out what happens next. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so obviously, I want you to grab your Bibles, open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Gospel of John, chapter 20. I'm actually going to go ahead and reread the two verses that opened our passage last week. Uh, It was also our scripture reading last week. We're going to do it again this week to make sure that we're all on the same page and understand where the timeline is. Grab your Bibles, open up to John chapter 20, and starting at verse 1. If you're there, say amen. If you need another minute, just say, have mercy. Some of you are still flipping your pages. What's taking you so long? (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) I couldn't help myself. I can be a little impatient sometimes. (laughs) All right, all right. I think the pages have stopped turning. Apple users are already there. Android, you'll get there soon. So... (laughs) Now, of course, I make all these jokes. Who's having the technology problems today? (laughs) So it goes both ways. But hopefully that little joke gives us a chance. We're all in John chapter 20, starting at verse 1. John records, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the, tomb, that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran, and, uh, she ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, They've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. That, of course, led to our whole discussion last week. She ran to tell the boys, and then they all came back. Now, as I said, the boys have come and the boys have gone, but Mary is still there. So you scroll down, you skim down to verse 11, and you find this. Mary is standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two Uh, Actually, before we get to that one, let's pause for a second. She stooped and looked in. Does that sound familiar to anybody? What happened back in verse 5 when John arrived at the tomb? He stooped and he looked in. 
He went there, but not all the way there. He stopped just before the finish line, and it says he stopped and he looked in, and bonus points for anybody who remembers this. When it says that he looked, the Greek word was blepo. Do you remember what I said the implication was? What part of him was he looking with? He was just looking with his eyes last time. That's right. Now, what's interesting is, it says here in verse 11 that Mary does something similar. She stooped and looked in. Now, I hate to cause any trouble here, but the word for looked is not in the Greek at all. I'd love to make a comparison back to uh, what either John did or what Peter did, but all it literally says in the Greek is that she stooped and in. And so we supply looked because that makes the most sense, but I can't help but wonder if there's another option as well. Is this something where she may have tried to move in or she may have just felt drawn towards it? I don't know. Uh, That's all assumption based on the lack of a Greek word there. But it is interesting that she goes through the same process that John went through. Do you think she might go through more stages of last week's journey as well? Well, let's find out because like I was about to read verse 12, she stooped and she looks in and she saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been laying. She saw, do you know what she saw? Or uh, the Greek word there, we'll go that way. The Greek word there was theoreo. Do you remember last week's sermon? Last week, we gave you three Greek words for saw that were found in John chapter 20. Theoreo, I said, to put it simply, refers to looking with what part of the body? Refers to looking with your eyes, with your heart, with your brain. Which one was it? It was brain. These are the people who can look and analyze details, but perhaps it doesn't quite fully process. This is Peter looking into the tomb and seeing the clothes all laying there and folded and and picking up more details than John did with his fast glance, but still not really putting two and two together. Well, this is Mary, exactly, because what does she look and see? She sees two angels, and she's basically like, oh, hi, guys, where's Jesus? Jesus. She is about the only person I can think of in the Bible who has not one but two angels appear in front of her, and the first words out of the angel's mouth doesn't have to be, don't be afraid. Because she's not looking at the angels and processing anything other than she's looking for Jesus, right? So we have Mary looking, and she, she, they actually say to her, dear woman, why are you crying? And they ask her, and she says, because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. Now do you understand why we read verse 2? She continues to have this struggle. This is the thread between these two stories. The question is, where is Jesus? Which is why my mini-series is called Finding Jesus. But did they find Jesus last week? When Peter and John ran and they got to the tomb and they looked, did they find Jesus? No, he wasn't there. They found pretty much the only place that they knew he wasn't, and that was in the tomb. Now, that was enough to cause all sorts of stirring in their hearts, and especially stirring in John's heart. As he looked and realized, he's not here, maybe some of those things he was talking about actually came to pass. But if they know that the only place for sure, if they're looking for Jesus, if they know that Jesus is the goal, and they know that he's not in the tomb, then why is Mary staying at the only place where she knows that Jesus isn't? Think about that. They've thoroughly searched the tomb. They've gone through. They've looked at it with their eyes and their head and their heart. They've gone through the details, they've looked around, and they know for sure he's not here. Do the angels resolve any of this? Unfortunately, no. Because what happens next is in verse 14, Mary turns to leave without another word from the angels or another reference to the angels. 
And she turns to leave, and she sees someone standing there. Now, it was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Now, I want to pause for a second. Didn't I just say the only place we knew for sure that Jesus wasn't was here? But he was. Sometimes what we know and the truth can be two very different things, right? We thought we had it all figured out. We knew for sure there is no Jesus here. But what would have happened if she had just taken it for granted that she knew that and would have walked away without ever meeting the gardener that day? It's interesting how often we can know things that may not be the whole story. So there's Jesus. She just didn't recognize him. There's more details that she needed, and so we get some more details in verse 15. In verse 15, my Bible has it in red. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? So she says, or she thought it was the gardener. So she says, if you'd taken him away, sir, tell me where you've put him. I'll go and get him. Now, uh, I had a few commentaries who actually had a good laugh at this. Because how well thought out is her plan in reality? She brought the boys with her. The boys could have helped her carry the body if something happened. If the guards had decided to do something reckless, they could have dealt with the guards. We know Peter's pretty good at dealing with the guards and if he's got a sword with him, right? But the boys have left. Mary's by herself in this part of the story. Let's assume nothing nefarious is going on here. Let's assume that they just maybe, I don't know, set it off to the side while they clean the tomb a little bit. You know, you'd, you'd misplace something while you're doing some spring cleaning. Mary says, I'll, I'll take care of it. No offense to Mary or any woman here, but what are the odds that a single woman, or in many cases man, could have picked up a dead body wrapped in linen cloths and carried it to where it needed to be? without the use of a, a wheelbarrow. Yeah, exactly. Odds are not pretty good. Uh, if you don't know the idea of trying to pick up dead weight or trying to go boneless, it is amazing how heavy a four-year-old can be if they don't want to be picked up. Now picture a fully grown man who is equally not participating in this lifting experience. But she's not worried about these details. All she wants is Jesus. She'll, she'll work everything else out later as soon as she has him back in her life. That's all she wants is Jesus in her life. I'll go and get him. I don't care where he is. I don't care what I have to do. I will be there. Now, notice something interesting. He's already said not one, but two sentences to her, right? She has heard his voice. But dare I say, much in the same way that she can look with her eyes, but it doesn't connect to her brain, it doesn't connect to her heart, you're not putting two to two together, you're not thinking clearly, maybe she didn't hear clearly either, because she wasn't expecting to hear what she heard. But then she heard this, one simple word, Mary. Verse 16, Mary, Jesus said, and she turned to him and she cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. She cried out, Rabbi. Out of all of the pet names for Jesus, it's interesting that the one that she prefers in this story is teacher. This is a good reminder that each of us can have our own experience and our own encounter with God, right? Each of us can have our own meaningful relationship with him. And at different stages, we may want to call him something different because he speaks to us in different ways. But what she needed here, because she was looking with her brain, she had questions, and so she's turning to her teacher who can give her answers, right? And at this point, because this is the happily ever after that we've been waiting for since verse 2, Mary doesn't know where Jesus is. We, none of us knew where Jesus is. We finally found Jesus. This is probably the point where some of you wished that 14 verses ago we could hit skip intro. Skip the story of the boys running to the tomb. Skip the story of the angels because to be honest with you, none of those things matter. They don't teach us anything about faith, right? <laughs> 
let's just get to the good stuff. I wish the Bible would just get to the good stuff sometimes, right? Ah. <sighs> But John took the time to record some of these details. Maybe for our sake, maybe to rub it in Peter's face that he's faster than him. Whatever the reason is, those details matter. We can't just always skip around to the good stuff because sometimes the good stuff is the stuff we want to skip. Because sometimes that's the stuff that we need to hear, not just the stuff that we want to hear. And so as we're wrestling with what happens, that question we have of the day, what, ha- what do we do when soon isn't soon enough? Why don't we just skip to the good parts? And why do we just take our time and drag our feet? Honestly, you know why? Because God does sometimes. If you were here last fall, you know we had a chance to go through the stories of Daniel and Revelation together. Our Sabbath morning sermons were from Revelation. Our Wednesday, our Wednesday midweek uh, Bible studies were taken from the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, we discovered a really interesting story that includes one of the most incredible lines that I've ever seen as it comes to the concept of prayer. We, of course, have Janet Thurber coming in a couple of weeks to talk about prayer. The story of Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9 is one of the most incredible lines that I wish I could teach as normative and say that if you do it right, it always happens this way. But if I did, we'd be amazed at how much trouble we'd get into. Here's what I mean. In Daniel chapter 9, in verse 21, Daniel has just been praying almost the entire chapter thus far. The first 17 verses, or there's a 17 verse prayer from Daniel. And Daniel says in in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 21, as I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in that earlier vision, he's talking about chapter 8, and whom I had seen in the earlier vision, he came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he explained to me, he said, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. You have questions about your, your visions? I've come here to explain them. And he specifically says this, the moment you began praying, a command was given. And so I'm here to tell you what it was, for you were very precious to God. Listen carefully so you can understand the meaning of your vision. Did you hear that line? At the moment you started praying, I was sent to come and answer your prayer. I wish God would answer our prayers that quickly sometimes, don't you? How many have something that you pray for and then you wait? Like some, uh, prayer can be so awesome to use as a tool, even if you know that the result is going to be no. Like at least a no would be helpful sometimes, right? A crystal clear, God says no. We have a real hard time with that silence though, don't we? We wish we just knew one way or the other, just tell us now, get it over with God, yes or no. Well here, Daniel's told, from the moment you began praying... Gabriel was told, go into that prayer. But you know what's interesting about this story? Is that's not the whole story. This prayer in Daniel chapter 9, going back to verse 1, we're told happens in the first year of Darius the Mede, the son of Azurius, when he became king over the region. This happened in 538 B.C. Now what's interesting was, this prayer is in response to the vision that happened in Daniel chapter 8 previous chapter. We just turn the page, right? We turn the page. For Daniel, Daniel chapter 8 happened in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. That's approximately 553 BC. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you're a, I don't know, like a math teacher to tell the difference between 553 and 538. I'll just tell you it's about 15 years. So it's, me, it's tempting to look at Daniel chapter 9, that, that arrival of Gabriel in verse 21 and beyond, and to say, I wish when I prayed that God would answer my prayer right now, just like he did for Daniel. But is that how it worked? You think Daniel had only prayed that prayer for the very first time that particular day? Or do you think he'd been praying that prayer every single day for a decade and a half? And nothing, and nothing, and nothing, until finally, God gave him something. 
Time is one of the tools that God will use to help us to understand his ways. You see, we struggle with God's ways. We struggle with why he does what he does, and sometimes we struggle with when he does it. But this process is here to help us understand, not just, we may not even understand why he does what he does when he does it, but through this, may we use this as a chance to know that we can have faith in who he is apart from those things that he does and when he does it and why he does it. May we have faith in who he is. I don't want to spoil too much, but I happen to know that in a little while you will hear a message from John chapter 11. And I will just simply point out that in the story of Jesus and Lazarus, there's a line in there in verses 5 and 6 that I just sticks with me and I have to use that today. And I won't say too much so it doesn't spoil it for anybody else who might be talking from that passage later. All we know is in John chapter 11, verse 5, so although Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days, which leads to the struggles of the rest of John chapter 11. Where were you if you would have been here? What took you so long? These challenges. We may not understand the when, but we have to have faith in who he is. God will frequently use time and delay to better help us to be prepared to receive his promises. In fact, I'm pretty sure it says in the verse just before that, in verse 4, these things are happening so that God can be glorified. So here we are back in John chapter 20, And what stands out to me is the goal of Mary is to find Jesus. Where's Jesus? All I want is Jesus. And at this point, there could have been four times when Jesus could have appeared to her and he chose not to. When she arrived for the very first time in verse 1, could he have been there? Yep. When she ran to grab the boys and they came back, could he have been there? Yep. Chose not to. And then the boys left. Could have popped out from behind a tree. Hey, Mary. Didn't. Angels appeared instead. And so finally at this point, in verse 14 and 15, when she says and she looks at the gardener, she thinks he's a gardener. She waits until, and remember, she's walking away at this point. She might have accidentally missed Jesus. But then he shows up in disguise. And it isn't until this point that she finally hears him and accepts him and embraces him. And in fact, when she embraces him, that leads to its own pile of problems. Because in verse 17, when she embraces him, he actually says, don't cling to me, for I haven't yet ascended to my father, but go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. The first appearance of Jesus post crucifixion, resurrection, the first appearance to humanity is to a woman. The first message that is to be proclaimed is now to this, out of all of the disciples, he picked the other one. It's amazing how sometimes we like to put God in a box about who he can and can't work through, and then he just says, oh, by the way, I got another one over here. As Adventists, uh, we have a lady in our own past that was the other one, right? And I'm thankful for the ministry of that other one. But that's a different discussion. But there's something interesting I do have to take a minute here to talk about. When he says, don't cling to me for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. Well, this leaves somebody else struggling with, uh, well, where are you, Jesus? When are you going to, Jesus? And you know who's struggling with this? It's Mark Cornett. Well, not actually Mark Cornett. It was the guy that Mark Cornett was portraying a couple of weeks ago during our Easter program as he stood right over here strapped to a cross. You remember the thief on the cross? Jesus gave him a promise in Luke chapter 23 when the thief on the cross says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He says, Luke chapter 23 and verse 42, he says that. And Jesus says as clear as he can, 
I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's a great promise, but it is problematic if you aren't clear on this issue. Because Jesus just said, I haven't gone to heaven yet. But two days earlier, he said someday, or he, he told the guy on the cross, we're going to heaven today, right? It, wait, no, she's shaking her head. That's not what he said? No, that's not what he said. If you're looking in your Bible and you see where the comma is placed, where it says, assuredly I say to you, comma means pause, today you will be with me in paradise, that's where you may get this mindset that, oh, the thief on the cross was supposed to go with Jesus on, on the day that he died, on Friday. And so when Jesus is still hanging out at Mary's house on Sunday, you start to get that problem of people who say, I'll be there soon. I'm on my way. Haven't really left my house yet. Unless that's not what Jesus told the thief on the cross. You see, if you go back to the Greek, I'd love to put this on the screen right now. Ugh. One of the things that's noteworthy is the fact that the original Greek did not include punctuation. In fact, the original Greek did not include spaces between words. In fact, the original Greek, for many years, did not have lowercase letters. It was all just uppercase. I had a chance when I was in seminary to take a class on the history and formation of the New Testament, and they gave us copies of actual manuscripts. You think English chicken scratch is hard to translate? Just wait till somebody hands it to you and it's in Greek. And there are no spaces between the words, and they're all in uppercase. And why did he draw a fish in the margins? Oh, wait, that's not a fish, that's a word. What? Some of these things did not enter into the Greek language until centuries later. We didn't have verse breaks until 1,100 years later. So some of these things were added as interpretive markings. They're going to make it easy for you to understand. Just trust me, I understand them. And so they put the breaks where they break, they break them, and they put the commas where they, and the periods, and the questions. They did it all to help us better understand. But in this particular case, we understand it worse. Because if Jesus told the thief on the cross that he's going to see him today in heaven, and he's still not in heaven on Sunday, either Jesus is the worst teller of time ever, worse than me when I tell my wife I'll be home in 10 minutes, and I'm still chatting with you guys in the foyer. <laughs> or Jesus didn't say that to the thief on the cross. In fact, if you just move the comma one word later, instead you get the idea, assuredly I say to you today, as in today I'm telling you this, you will be with me in paradise. It shifts the promise from you're going to go with me to heaven today to I'm giving you this hope today because sometimes we need a hope today. The thief on the cross couldn't wait until tomorrow to know that it was going to be okay. He didn't have a tomorrow. All he had was today. As Adventists, part of that Advent meaning is that we are looking towards the advent, the second coming, the hope of a future. But I hate to contend this, but sometimes we are so busy staring at our promises of what God is going to do in the future that we forget to experience the promises that he has for us today. When Jesus wrestled with Mary and Martha back in John chapter 11, he pointed them to a future resurrection, but then he also pointed them to the reality that he is the reason to have hope today. When he pointed the thief on the cross to what he could experience, he didn't point to just a future promise, but he gave him, assuredly because of who I am, I promise this today. He gave him hope today. And so this day when Mary's here waiting for Jesus, hoping for Jesus, the angels could have very simply said to him, or to Mary, oh, don't worry about him. You'll see him someday, right? He's coming again in the clouds. Could have preached that whole sermon, given him a whole Bible study on it. But she didn't need that tomorrow. She needs something today. And in verse 18, 
after Jesus has said this, after Jesus has said, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. I go to, now go and find my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. To be honest with you, he's not speaking to Mary. He's being prepared to speak through Mary, and we'll deal with that next week. But for now, I can't help but think, man, that gives her all kinds of hope that she needs today. And wouldn't you know, Mary Magdalene, verse 18, found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And she gave him, she gave them his message. (sighs) I want you to know, God has many good things that he will give to you soon. He's promised it. But just as much as he's promised good things to you tomorrow, some of you need to know that today, God wants to give you today an assurance of his love and his presence today. There is good news today because some of you need that today. He wants to be here today. And I'll admit that part of that today is to prepare you to wait until that tomorrow. In case soon isn't coming soon enough. And we have to wait. And we have to endure. And we have to deal with a platform covered in flowers is we have to deal with a Facebook wall filled with comments, is we have to struggle and wait for a day when all of these things will be done away with. But until then, he wants to be with you. And I can't help but notice that one of his promises, that when his spirit has come upon you, one of the things he's going to give you, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, what passage is that? Anybody know? What's in Galatians 5 that talks about when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive the fruit of the Spirit. You will receive love and joy and peace and kindness and faithfulness and patience. Come on, King James people, what do you get? Long suffering. But you're not going through it alone because God's Spirit is with you. And so sometimes as we struggle with what's happening next, that's today's sermon, what happens next, don't miss what God's doing right now. What is God doing right now? So our closing song today is from the hymnal. Number 251. I love this one because it says this. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, the author Alfred Ackley wrote about a hundred years ago. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. He's not just working in the future. He's not just working back then. We want to offer you something today a living Savior. He's got you taken care of. I want you to stand and sing with us.